comfortable again. Okay. I'll, I'll have an answer for you before the end. All right, and we are live. All right, thank you. Give it just a second before we begin and get some folks to join. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special edition of Ask Me Anything. Our guest today is the, dare I say, legendary Megan Bearsford, right? We, we, we make sure we got the name right. Uh, she comes from royal lineage because of her work uh, in international work with children, as well as her work with communities in the broadband space. Uh, it is my pleasure, again, to introduce to you and bring to you to this Ask Me Anything event, uh, the, the le legendary, if I say legendary, uh, Megan <laughs> Bertford, the Director of Broadband Programs with Learn, Design, Apply, Incorporated. Uh, they are known for being a preeminent grant writing shop, but they are more than, than grant writers. Uh, they also provide project management and broadband consulting services to communities and projects across the country. So without further ado, everyone, please welcome Megan to the show. Megan, welcome. Thank you. Um, I feel like, Scott, we should give a, a disclaimer to everyone. The uh, fire alarm in my building has, has gone off. Uh, it is uh, possible it might go off again, in which case, apologies. It's not a lie detector or anything. Yes, it is. It's a, it's a <laughs> BS tour to, to install so that we can keep you at least wholesale honest um, as we move forward yeah. with today's AMA. But everyone, if you have not done so, uh, Drew Clark uh, done did a fabulous expose write-up uh, on the background and summary of Megan. I call her Megs. We're friends. Uh, you can't call her that, uh, but I can <laughs> Um, but we want to make sure when I last left Megan, uh, she had just completed a legendary karaoke performance at Broadband Communities Conference. And, and, and Megan, can you come on before we get really super serious uh, about your work and how you help communities across the country? Can, can you talk about this legendary performance and let me set it up? Because I believe you had a you had a, a wardrobe malfunction with a sweater that you managed to navigate the sweater, complete the song, uh, and I believe you received a standing ovation uh, from the seven or eight people that were there in attendance at uh, four o'clock in the morning at the uh, uh, community. I will say it was a it was a full audience. Was there, full there was audience. no audience when I did my first song, which right. was Fancy, and it was a bad choice because I don't know all the words to Fancy, so. But it was, it was Texas. I thought I should do something country, but uh, no, so I was holding the beer and, and trying to theatrically, as, as part of the scene, take off my, my nice pink guard, cardigan, but it got caught on my hand holding the beer. And I was just so dedicated that, you know, it was, it was, it was a little maneuvering, but uh, I think it just, you know, it's, it's an example of how much dedication I bring to everything that I do. <laughs> Yeah, karaoke I think that, or broadband. I think that actually summed you up, and uh, if I could sum up a moment, <laughs> that would be analogous to uh, uh, how 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 you are in this community and your work. Like whatever you need to do to get the job done, uh, Megan Bearsford will definitely do it. So, Megan, let's get started, right? So, this is an okay. Ask Me Anything event where we invite members of the community on. Uh, to get to know you better, but really to ask questions. And there are a ton of questions in the community. Uh, I want to start by having you talk about your experience. Like, so I know you, we're friends. We travel across the country and have spoken at a lot of conferences and events. Uh, you are truly one of, of the special people uh, in this industry. You actually care about the work that you do and the people and the lives that you touch. Can you talk about your sort of international background, your teaching experience, and how, uh, or at least with the stories that we can share, uh, how that uh, has equated and allowed you to uh, be at the head of broadband programs that learn, design, apply, and, uh, and how that work ethic and background allows you, and how does that manifest in your work? Yeah, well, I, um, I did quite a few things before getting into broadband. So my first uh, international job was teaching English in rural Poland. So 
um, I would say that was kind of my first experience really being in a place that did not have interconnect or internet connectivity. Um, you know, I lived even in a more rural part of Poland and uh, had to, you know, put things in certain places to be able to steal the neighbor's internet because we didn't even have our own because it didn't come to that house. It was mountains, is a whole thing. Um, and- there we go. There we go. <laughs> Item number one on the on the on the BS meter. <laughs> Would it you was... like to start over, Megan? <laughs> so I was in Warsaw. Uh, no, it was rural Poland, um, and I I was stealing internet. I wasn't paying for it, but um, I had I had children of all ages, and and the school I was working at was for extra classes, um, and so it was something where you know there was already a clearly a big demand for continuing, you know, extra help with education. And at that time, you know, didn't click in my mind that, you know, they could have online courses at home uh, that could have helped. And, uh, you know, I was focused on trying to, to not have to learn Polish to teach English because I was quite bad at languages, but um, it was kind of that first experience for me of not really being able to be connected, you know, had a really hard time communicating with family and friends. And it was definitely an, an isolating uh, experience for where I lived, um, but a great one. I, I had the best time. And uh, next internationally was a similar thing in New Zealand. And it's, it's you know, similar, I think, to the U.S. where we think, oh, it's such a prosperous country, a very you know, rich country. Of course, everyone would have connectivity. Um, and, and that was kind of my thought of, of New Zealand as well until I was on the South Island, you know, working in a small pub and um, there was no Internet, you know, that we could use. And, and it was, again, Christmas time and I was there and couldn't FaceTime with my family and um, but also just such a wonderful experience as well. But I would say, you know, at, at that time, I was still kind of connecting the pieces of how much Internet had had a role in things and and what you know uh equal access and equitable full access really looked like and meant um and then when i came back to the states i was with um nag the national association of attorneys general and i think drew had a, a great question which i'll jump right into is really want you know when this, this i'm hosting the show man. Came... i'm hosting okay. the show. <laughs> right, Yes. That's what Wait, happens. That's when I can't go out. Violation. Oh, I am hosting the show. You're the guest. <laughs> I ask the questions. You answer okay. the this AMA. Let me. I just put it up so that. well for you, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Let me restate and get us back on track here. Um, as you all know, we know each other, but I'm going to set the stage again for those of you who just joined us. Uh, welcome to Ask Me Anything with Megan Bearsford. I am Scott Woods, president of public-private partnerships with Ready.net and Broadband.money. Uh, and Megan, want to you know, tell us about you were telling us about your your international background, uh, and then the the BS meter went off. So why don't we free frame this and let's talk about okay. your role and work at Learn Design Apply Inc. Right? I think a lot of people okay. know uh, LDA as being a grant writing shop, but as I explained at the top, you're much more than just grant writing. Although grant writing is a very important part of the work that you do. Uh, can you sum up for us before the BS meter goes off again, uh, your role at Learn, Design, and Apply and what uh, uh, LDA actually does? Yeah, so I started with LDA uh, during the pandemic. Um, so was doing some some job searching and, and you know, reading the news and really coming clear of, of what a big issue the digital divide was. And so you know, this job came along and seemed a great way to, to jump into that. Um, I didn't know all that much about broadband, didn't know, you know, a ton about the federal grant world or the state grant world, um, but, you know, learned pretty quickly. And, and LDA does, uh, as you say, more than just grant writing. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we help with getting people prepared for grants because they can be pretty hefty things. There's a lot of components to it, especially if you want to be successful. So there's, you know, a lot of a lot of pre-steps that LDA is able to help with. Um, and we work kind of with all kinds of clients. So we work with manufacturers. Um, we work with, you know, ISPs. We work with public. We work with private. 
you know, there's a different role for everyone in, in building these networks. And there's a way in which, you know, we can bring a lot of different players together and connect the communities to the resources through a lot of these different kinds of partnerships. Um, I'm just going to keep going. I'm, I'm powering through. We have... I promise I don't I don't have a clicker here. That's a very good, <clears throat> very good answer. Keep on. Keep, please continue, Megan. Uh, yeah. Is, so really good and we, you're providing. you know, one of the things that we do is, is we are a boutique firm. And so we're always finding new ways to to help communities and help people get their projects uh, funded and, you know, bring them to life. And uh, more than just broadband. So we have people who are doing energy grants, people doing uh, school safety grants, uh, health care, you know, really kind of, of across the board, these different uh, programs. Uh, but in my mind, it all comes back to broadband, right? So you can't have telehealth if you don't have broadband. You know, you can't get that USDA DLT grant. Um, you can't have, you know, your smart city if you're not having broadband. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do in these other realms that I think really comes back to what our core team here is doing. And we started with just two people and the demand grew and grew. And now we're a, a team of, of seven, soon to be eight. Um, and and busy as ever, right? Because of, of what's happening in, in the world and all of the money coming into to broadband from the BIL. And, you know, we're now just really trying to make sure that the money goes where it needs to be. And part of that is making sure that the players who should have the money are prepared to apply for it and receive it. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it's a really, it's not just we'll sit down and write. It's a lot more than that. Right. Let so that is a component. <laughs> right. That's a great segue. You know, we're on the precipice of uh, this huge announcement by NTIA uh, by the end of this month, by June 30th, NTIA will announce the initial allocation decisions uh, for all of the state broadband offices that are participating, which are all of them. Um, in, in the IIJA broadband grant programs, notably uh, the BEAD uh, to be followed up by Digital Equity Act programs. There are capital projects funds. There's middle mile decisions that are forthcoming. Like this is this is the, the time to be in, in, in broadband infrastructure and digital equity. Before we jump into the questions from, from the community, you know, can you sum up sort of how it, what are you hearing? What are the fears? What are the concerns? Uh, you know, what is the excitement from, the clients and prospective clients that you're working with uh, in the broadband industry. What, what is this expectation like in this period before, you know, this historic <laughs> money is starting? I have to say this has never gone off before. This is a, this is a verse, but uh, I would say there is a lot of excitement and a lot of fear. I would say it's they're They're kind of going hand in hand. I think everyone's realizing you know, what an opportunity this is and how many funds there are or how much funds um, and that, you know, all of these projects that maybe have would have been 10, 15 years down the road, if they happened at all, all of a sudden have the opportunity to come to life. Um, but there are a lot of requirements with it. And I think there is a fear about that. Um, there's not a lot of clarity on how things are going to go down yet. Um, I know offices are still preparing, but even with what we do know, right, there's some pretty uh, specific and yet vague at the same time requirements of BEAT. You know, they talk about your, your workforce development. They talk about cybersecurity and what does that actually mean and how does that actually look? Um, and I think that, you know, is, is either something that folks aren't thinking about at the moment or if they are, it's just kind of worrisome. Right. And I think that's, you know, even when grant programs are out, that's a difficulty that we see is people seeing requirements and thinking, well, how does this apply to me and what I do? Because mm -hmm. I don't see myself or my organization in this question. Right. And mm -hmm. it's a required one. And how do you tackle those when it doesn't fit how how you work or your business model or what you're trying to set up? And so I think there's a lot of apprehension on that, mm -hmm. um, you know, while at the same time, you know, recognizing there's this chance and I want to go for it, but then also that that bit of being overwhelmed by it. All right. Well, we again, we thank you for joining us on uh, the AMA today, Friday, June June 9th, excuse me. Let's jump right into the questions. Our first questions in the community comes from Drew Pappas, who I believe you know. 
Uh, it, his question is, when it comes to applying for broadband grants, different funding agencies often have varying requirements and criteria. Can you provide best practices for navigating this landscape of different funding agencies to ensure that applicants are well prepared to meet the specific needs and expectations of each, of each agency? That's a great question. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think we know there's kind of two, right now, two big federal players, USDA and NTIA. Um, and USDA has been putting on their programs for quite a while. And so we know what requirements USDA has, right? So I always suggest, you know, we have we have an inkling, we've heard, you know, word that there's going to be another round of reconnect. So go back and look at the guidance from reconnect four, right? It's not going to change drastically. And you can get that idea of what you're going to need to do, you can start preparing, um, you know, and not then be shell shocked when you see what the requirements are from before. So one big recommendation we have is always looking at past programs. What have they done in the past? And what can you glean from that of what will be required? Um, and, you know, in looking at those, you can kind of gather information of, okay, USDA is always going to ask these kinds of questions. I can be prepared for that. And NTIA is always going to be asking, you know, for five years on their performance. So I can be ready for that. So looking at it at the past, and, and you can say the same for state programs. I mean, not every every state has had a, a broadband grant program yet, but for those who have, you know, look at what they've done previously. If if it's not online, you can reach out and say, hey, state, can can you send me your guidance from your last thing so I can review? Um, you know, so, so you can be prepared. Um, so it it is a lot of different ones. I think there's similarities, but in terms of navigating it. I say always poke around in the past um, because you know there there are often some changes, but a lot of these programs stay somewhat the same year after year. Um, so so we can learn from what's been happening. Yeah, and then also, can you talk about how big the compliance part of it and and ongoing reporting requirements? Right, we're not really thinking about that yet because you know obviously the money has not hit the street, so to speak. Uh, but again, it's not just the uh, front end requirements like uh, the challenge process and uh, and some of the other processes to get to the to the projects. But I, it's also the the ongoing, you know, sometimes can be very onerous uh, reporting and compliance requirement, even well after uh, the projects have been implemented and deployed. Yeah, so absolutely. So those end pages of your guidance of your NOFO are usually where they start talking about what is going to be required for compliance, uh, what you're going to have to be reporting on. Um, so absolutely dig into those now. Uh, so you can know how to plan so you can know how to prepare. Because As you say, Scott, they, they are hefty. Sometimes there can be a lot of details. Some are easier than others. Um, and a lot of it, you know, if you're coming from a, a federal grant or it's being funded federally, like from ARPA or CPF or BEAD, um, you can go to, to the feds and see what treasury's reporting requirements are because you know you're going to have to follow those. So it's out there and it is important to educate yourself because, you know, it, the work doesn't stop grant wise after you get the money. It continues until your project is, is done and sometimes even after that. Um, so you want to know what you're committing to. It's it's great and it's oftentimes necessary to have these funds, but you also want to make sure that you prepare yourself um, for receiving them and then the reporting you're going to do and having a good understanding of that so you can stay in compliance. All right. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Dave Tott, and he asks, is there any way to get broadband grant money for producing better and open source software to manage routers? And for context, he says he has all volunteers working on things like LibreCoast.io and have long worked to produce better, more secure home routers in the OpenWRT project. And source code and tech support, as you know, doesn't grow on trees. So do you know of, of, of any particular ways or approaches to get grant money for producing that, that better software? So that, you know, some... some not a lot of grants have funds for the development of things. They may have funds for uh, products that are already in existence. Um, but I would say for that kind of work, there are other agencies that are, are giving grants. I mean, if you remember, uh, I think OMB came out with a report uh, 
last year about how many different agencies had grants that touched broadband or technology in some way. And it was massive. I mean, I th it, was, it was almost too much, but um, that kind of innovation grant. So you can think about um, the EDA. Um, they have innovation grants. You can think about NSF. You know, if they have any small development grants, you can think about small business association of, of can you get some smaller grants from there to, to start developing these programs. Um, I would say don't forget about the regional. Um, so the Appalachian Regional Commission, um, the Delta, Denali, uh, they have have grant programs as well where you can, you know, put together unique types of things that then relate back to broadband, relate back to back to those needs that will, will be happening. You know, they have, have ones where it's, you're doing computer programming um, and you're incorporating uh, training into it for youth, right? So, so think creatively about how you can address that, how you can go after it, um, fitting what you're doing into these other things, right? Like job training, how can you make what you're doing into a more of a job training type program? Um, so sometimes it does get, you need to get creative with what you're trying to find and see how you can fit what you're doing into something else. Because oftentimes you won't see a grant that is straightforward just for what you want to do. But, uh, you know, there, there are opportunities for development, but not in really any of, of the big ones like BEAD or, or USDA. Yeah, and they do have line items that, that encourage or at least uh, uh, apply to uh, software enhancements and that can be used for software, uh, and they're you know sufficiently uh, unambiguous enough for you know the the end user or grant uh, writer or grant uh, uh, application or applicant you know to fill in uh, exactly what they want to do in roles for uh, for software. So it's a uh, I would say uh, kind of descript indescript in how yeah. uh, it's 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 positioned so that they leave a lot of that impetus on the applicant to describe, uh, you know, how they want to use federal funds. Yeah. To, uh, it's to it's making your case, Absolutely. right? And if you can, if you can put forward the good argument of why this is needed and what it's going to do and what stage you're in. And I mean, I would say grant reviewers like seeing unique things like that's fun. It's not the same old, same old. So if you're, if you've got something that, you know, you're relating and saying, we're going to upgrade you know, in this way, and this is what it's going to look like, and this is what it's going to do. And you have the business details to back it up, right? You can't just be like, here's my, here's my, uh, you know, big idea in the clouds that I have no substance to. But um, if it's something unique and new, like grants, grant reviewers like to see that. Can we dive in that just a little bit before we go to the next question? I think it'd be really beneficial for the audience to understand uh, who is initially reviewing these grants, right? There's generally a team of grant reviewers that may or may not be associated with, uh, you know, the grant office or the program office um, of the granting agency. Can you just give our audience a highlight uh, on, on why, you know, structuring grant responses, you know, directly and clearly um, is beneficial uh, in this, in the federal funding and, and granting process? Yeah. Um, so I'll kind of, I think I think this answer can be applied to both state programs and federal programs, um, but they'll put together a team of reviewers um, that come. Some will come from from telecom and have industry background, and some won't. Um, some might have something similar, right? They might be in, in bridges for infrastructure, right? But you know they're needing a lot of people. So, um, in writing your answers, it's important to make sure that you're not using your own either internal jargon, so to speak, um, abbreviations that might not be uh, easily identifiable, um, and, and making it so anyone could understand what you're saying, what your project is, um, because we don't necessarily know the background of the reviewer. Um, they might be you know, two years in, and so they have some, but they don't have all the knowledge. And if they have to reread what you're doing many times, that's frustrating. They get frustrated. That leaves a bad taste, and that's not good for your project. You don't want the reviewer to have a bad taste in their mouth. Um, the second part of that is, is in terms of federal, um, it's then going to oftentimes go to another agency after that. Um, and that agency, you know, isn't NTIA. Uh, and so they don't have that same background that people at NTIA do. And they're getting into that nitty gritty. Um, so we see it with, um, for the, the tribal, I believe they're using 
oceanic and at NOAA, right? No. Mm -hmm. National Ocean NOAA. Uh, and then um, uh, they also use NIST. Um, so looking at NIST and, uh, you know, they have very small crews um, and their crews are not trained in broadband. Um, so it's so important to make what you what you write and what you describe as easy as possible to understand. Because, you know, again, the more confusing it is, the less likely you're going to move forward. A great question here from Drew Clark, our regular host of AMA. He says, uh, ask the question, what is the role that chat GPT and other AI tools are playing in potentially facilitating the grant writing experience? That's a great, great, great question from Drew. I am so excited to talk about this. <laughs> Make sure uh, the media doesn't go off in the in the back. I know. <laughs> It'll, it, the BS meter. Uh, no, it um, because this ties into so many things um, that I think are are important considerations, and we have different suggestions and different feelings on Chat GPT. It can be a great resource. When you say um, we, let me, I'm sorry to interrupt you. When you say we, you're oh, talking about you, you LDA. Crew at LDA. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, gosh, I'm just surprised the meter didn't go off on you, Scott. <laughs> um, no, so we have, we, uh, it can be a great resource if you are stuck, if you don't know how to begin, if you're not sure how to approach something. Um, it can be a, a great resource for putting it in, uh, but you should not believe what it puts out. So uh, there are three things. One at the very bottom of ChatGPT, it gives a warning that uh, facts, places, and statements may be inaccurate, in which case it's like, oh, okay, you don't wanna submit inaccurate information. Uh, it only uses the 2010 census data um, so you're not getting the most recent census data that a lot of applications are going to look for. So you're going to have to fact check everything ChatGPT gets you because you cannot trust it. Um, the other consideration is, and I know of a few organizations, um, that their internal cybersecurity policies do not allow them to use uh, AI tools like that. So, you know, be sure, especially if you're if you're coming from from local government, state government, uh, that your internal IT policies allow you to use that kind of technology because there is a cyber risk with using ChatGPT. Any information that you put into there, if there is a hack, is open to the public. Um, and so you want to be really careful about the information you you put in. Um, and that's just a best cyber practice anyway. And then comes back into BEAD because BEAD requires a cyber plan of you. So uh, <laughs> now you want to make sure you're practicing good, good, they call it cyber hygiene, and I really hate that term, but you wanna make sure you have good cyber hygiene um, and that and that you're not putting your organization at risk. So uh, another consideration when, when using it, but it can be so helpful in getting started, especially for, um, you know, if, if you've never tackled a grant before, if you don't know how to begin, um, it can get things going for you. And so I think it, it should be, a, or maybe not should be, but it can absolutely be a tool that can be utilized, but don't trust everything that it gives you and be very careful with the information that you put in. The last point on it is that it can't tell the story of your community, right? The things that make um, your arguments persuasive are, are those stories from your community, the facts from your community. Um, you know what, what the churches are saying, ChatGPT doesn't. You know, you know who's really pushing for this program. It doesn't. So there are still components that you will have to do yourself. Um, so it cannot do the whole thing for you. Um, so, you know, the biggest thing is, is just make sure you're checking it um, and that you're also being safe with the information that you ask of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, this is a big, big issue and big development, as you as you well know, and we've discussed before. Um, our next question comes from, I guess, one of your current clients, Joe Valandra, with the uh, Tribal uh, Ready, the president and CEO. He says, give you some kudos. We are very pleased to have LDA as a partner working on behalf of tribal nations. Uh, LDA is best when understanding working in ending country. So his question is, how does your approach at LDA differ for Indian country uh, and juxtapose that with your work with Tribal Ready? 
uh, how does our how is it different from how our work with tribes? Differ for that? Indian country than I guess your normal uh, your your broad okay. work with with other communities or other projects. Yeah, so I would say first and foremost, when we go and work with a, a, a tribe, we recognize we are working with a sovereign nation, um, and we recognize that we are working with a group that has historically been ignored um, and had frankly, horrible experiences with the federal government. Um, and so a big thing is, is listening to the tribe's concerns and their needs and building trust. Um, you know, I, I think in, in any project, you want to listen to your client, um, but, you know, be very, very cognizant of whether you are suggesting something, whether you are pushing an idea, or are you listening um, and helping, helping, um, create rather than dictate. Um, and so I would say is, that is something we are especially aware of when we come and, and work with tribes is that they know their story best, they know their needs best, you know, which can be said for, for any community, right? You know, we don't always live in the same state as our clients, but um, I think there is, is a, a kind of deference that you need to have that you are working with a sovereign nation um, and understanding of of the history of, of the people you're working with. Um, so we try to have that same respect um, and, and, and understanding that we are coming into something we don't know in terms of the community with any client, um, but especially with, with, with um, Indian country. All right, our next question comes from the community, comes from Adi Dugar, who asks, what is the biggest challenge that service providers face when applying for grants and how can state broadband offices or states ease that burden? Um, so I would say for ISPs, resources, I think you kind of hinted at this at the beginning, Scott, is that often there's not enough resources, right? Everyone's wearing 10 hats already, doing other things. There's not, you know, the time you would, you would want to be able to dedicate to a grant. So um, I think having, having, you know, enough people and there, there isn't enough of LDA to go around. And, you know, those are a lot of the cases of why we're brought in is because, you know, that the, they just don't have the people to dedicate. Um, so I think, you know, on, on states recognizing that and seeing where you can streamline your grant application process, um, you know, recognizing that there is a lot of data that they need to collect. Um, but what is the, the most streamlined way, the easiest way to be able to collect that and put it into a grant? So thinking about, you know, how the, the applications are formatted, you know, are there sometimes kind of repetitive questions, you know, how much clarity is being provided, which, you know, I recognize sometimes, you know, you have questions that are mandated from your, your federal funds that are vague in themselves, but, you know, I think providing as much clarity and, and you know, being as streamlined as possible is uh, going to be a huge benefit to, to service providers that don't have the resources to, to spend a lot of time on the grants. And um, I think, I think then another thing that could be, you know, for states, but also on, on a potential applicant um, is doing some research. You know, there's, there's things we know that are going to be needed. We know you're going to need your audited uh, financial statements. We know you're going to need a pro forma. You're going to need to show sustainability. You know, you're going to have to talk about your workforce. So there's things that we know that are going to happen. And so those are things that can, you know, be thought about now, have a huddle about it now, start jotting down notes on it now. So when a program does open, that's one less thing that you have to start from the beginning that you have to tackle. Um, and so, you know, could be hints from the broadband office of, you know, hey, refer back to this and look what we know is going to be on this application, you know, start thinking about it now. So, you know, just because an application hasn't opened doesn't mean you can't be working on it. Um, so, you know, I think there's there's ways to combat the resource issue on both sides. I want to circle back uh, to your, your question about what the reviewers see. And, and Ben Khan asked the question, uh, what are what are some bedrock red flags that application reviewers may look for when evaluating applications? And are there any common pitfalls that applicants should aim to avoid at all costs? And Megan, you and I have talked about this 
before, we know kind of inside baseball, uh, you know, depending on the sheer volume of the applications or, uh, that the, or the applicants that apply for a grant program, reviewers oftentimes start off with looking at ways to disqualify applicants or applications before they get into the substantive, you know, criteria of, you know, evaluating yeah. which ones to go into more detail. So Ben's question is, can you identify uh, some some bedrock red flags to to absolutely not put in your application to ensure you don't get put in that uh, don't worry about it file? Uh, I would relate that to um, do exactly what it asks you to do. Um, which means reading the guidance very carefully and asking questions when you don't understand. Um, instead of making something up or kind of tailoring it to what you want to do, right? So I know I keep talking pro formers here, but you know, if you're not able to show sustainability to year eight and they ask you for year five, they may not want you to go out to year eight, even though you're like, I'm doing this extra work to show you. If they say they only want year five and you give them year eight, you didn't follow their directions, you're out, right? So even if you think you're enhancing it in some way by veering off what they're asking, it can be detrimental and you, you can get kicked out because you didn't follow the instructions, right? It's, it's, it's read the directions, you know, when you're building your bookshelf, you don't want to miss a piece because you, you know, didn't read the directions and then it's all wonky, right? Same thing for your application. You want to read every, every word. So you're not missing, either you're not adding components that they don't want, or you're not missing things that they do want. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, another example for that is, you know, you're going to have a GIS shape file of your project area. Um, and for one grant, you may have only had to put down your fiber route, right? But another grant is going to want to see every poll. They're going to want to see data on what the poverty rate in that area is. They're going to have a whole list of what they want on it. So, you know, when you see shapefile, don't just assume it's a shapefile with, you know, these two things that you did before. Because if you hand that in and they're like, well, you didn't give us all your the information we wanted, so you're out. Right. right. So I think the biggest pitfall is just not doing exactly what they tell you to do. Um, either if it's it's too less or too much. So um, I think those are, as you say, Scott, like the easy ways they're like, oh, they didn't listen. Yeah. I'm gonna throw a softball in here. Can you recommend any tools states and ISPs can leverage to help them a win and apply for broadband grants? Well, I've heard of this little site, Broadband Money. Uh, no, but I, I will say like, you know, beyond, you know, loving hanging out with you, Scott, uh, the, the platform you're working for, what, you, what you're representing here is an amazing tool. Um, you know, having all of these resources in one place, having this community, having the support, um, being able to ask questions, um, that's, that's a huge benefit of helping, you know, hearing what people are saying and what are people understanding. And, you know, let's all talk about Pennsylvania and do we get this? And, you know, where can I find all of this data in one spot and, you know, here it is. So I think that's absolutely like what you guys have built is, is fantastic. Um, and is so helpful, you know, even for us as grant writers, when we have clients working on your platform and, you know, just so easy to, to pull information. Uh, I would say also, you know, outside of that census data, get used to the census website. Um, they're going to, you know, your grant's going to ask you about the census information. So being familiar with how it works, because sometimes it is clunky or confusing. Um, so, you know, the census website is another one that, you know, I have bookmarked, you know, right next to broadband money where I go and, and, you know, read what people say and put down emojis. Yeah. That's how I respond to things. Well, thank you for that. And uh, your, your next several old fashions will be on me. So no worries about yes. that. <laughs> so our next question goes back. I want to uh, reframe everyone. We're at 3.09 p.m. Eastern time. We are with uh, the GOAT, the OG, if you will, of, of broadband grant writing and uh, project management, Megan Beresford or Bears Ford. For those of you who uh, I'm, I'm waiting for the alarm to go off because that I am nice waiting on it to go. I was been waiting on it to go off before. <laughs> You're going to tease me. Do you still have your blankie? 
Is the blankie still is still a viable option? <laughs> okay, I have a blanket on my legs because it gets cold. <laughs> the alarm went off, so I jumped, and Scott saw my blanket on my legs because they get cold. It's not a blankie. It's a blankie. It's very professional looking. It's professional, professional looking, looking, but it's a blankie. Uh, so Megan, I, I, want to get back, I want to get back to, to a little bit about you and your background. And Drew asked this question. How did your experience in working for the uh, National Associations of Attorney General impact your understanding of the role that telecommunications and telemedicine uh, plays in people's lives? Yeah, so that was uh, an amazing little uh, four years that I spent with them. And I learned so much, one of which was, I don't want to be a lawyer, but no offense, hey. Scott. <laughs> um, but, you know, the first time, you know, telemedicine in particular really hit. So each year, an attorney general would be able to choose their topic that they wanted to focus on, whoever the president was. And it was Attorney General George Jepson of Connecticut, and his, his initiative was healthcare in the 21st century. And so, there were throughout the year all sorts of of panels and you know obviously they all had a, a legal component to them because it's the attorneys general but um there was a lot of thought of you know how how much could be fixed by preventative medicine right and and i remember hearing a story about a man in wyoming who had a heart attack you know got to the hospital after an hour and a half of driving had to get on a helicopter and by the time they, you know, got him to the hospital in, in Denver, he was dead. Um, and so you think about these people in very rural areas, and if you could have the connectivity to have telemedicine and do preventative medicine, you know, it's life saving. You know, they, they and there were so many stories throughout that year that that kind of led us back to and beyond having a, a specific panel just on telemedicine, it was is that entire year of you know thinking about. How can our healthcare system, which, you know, some people love it, some people hate it, it might be broken, but, you know, it is what it is at the moment. And how can we make it better? How can we make sure people are as healthy as they can be? Um, and, and a huge part of that is telemedicine, um, especially, especially for rural America, but even, even urban communities, you know, where you have people who can't take time off work to do this, you know, how, how do we help them? Um, and and you don't have you don't have telemedicine without broadband, obviously. But um, working with them, and again, it, it, it was always the legal bent, but uh, behind it was, was you know this lesson of of how critical and how life saving telehealth can be. Absolutely, I want to ask you another question because I know you so well, and you describe this in your IO profile as a self described reader, hiker, and whiskey drinker. What is your top book recommendation? your favorite hiking location, and your number one whiskey? Well, it's really hard to choose a favorite book. Um, recently, I have been uh, reading a lot of retelling of Greek mythology, which has been fascinating. So I read one that was um, The Silence of the Girls, which I would recommend. It was about the Iliad. Um, I'm rereading Circe, which is about um, the Odyssey and Circe, who in the Odyssey has like one page and she's they paint her as a villain because she turned Odysseus's men into pigs, which can we blame her, to be honest? Like, is that really villainous? <laughs> I see no harm. Uh, anyway, but that book is like her, her story, right? Absolutely. So um, there's been a lot of, I've, that's been a big kick for me and I would recommend those for anyone kind of looking for a, a, a different fun read. Uh, and if you want to read while you're hiking, uh, which I don't do. Well, sometimes I've done that, but only when you get somewhere really beautiful, which for me, some of my favorite hiking has been done in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, but I also really love state parks. I mean, obviously national parks are gorgeous. There's a reason they're national parks, but there's a lot of smaller state parks that, um, you know, I, I, I've hiked in, in Virginia and California and um, Colorado that are are really beautiful. And so um, anything with me, anything with mountains, um, I'm, I'm a fan of for, for hiking, um, whiskey. So I'm a bit of a, a whiskey snob. I will aficionado. freely admit aficionado. 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 Exactly. Aficionado. Um, 
I really prefer scotch, uh, to be honest. So whiskey without an E, but uh, my favorite one that I kind of always have on hand is a Talisker 10 year. I really like the PD, the PD whiskeys. Mm -hmm. um, there's one in, in Scotland that you can't get outside of there called the Coal Ela is, is the distillery and it's their moch, which is the Gaelic term that I might be butchering. But it's really good. It's like the perfect balance of peatiness and smooth, which you don't always get when you have a peaty whiskey. So, but that's in the U.S., absolute best I've ever had. absolute best I ever had was it's the Oben. It's the Caribbean cast of uh, Scotch blended with uh, Caribbean rum. So they put it, finish it in Caribbean Ooh. rum barrels. It's it's absolutely absolutely the best. Uh, uh, since you're channeling your 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 inner Jace with the with the headphones, uh, Jace asks, can you say more about this whiskey aficionado? Where does where is the source? Where does it come from? Uh, again, if there are any children watching, we're not advocating um, you know you know alcohol, but uh, for those who have a sophisticated palate, uh, we are yeah. talking about the uh, aficionado portion of today's program. Uh, I so I came about my love of whiskey when I was in college. Um, so I went to a, a small liberal arts school and had my favorite history professor who would um, invite myself and, you know, some of my, my peers over for dinner. And after every dinner, he would bring out Laphroaig. And the first time I tried it, Smoky, I was Smoky. like, oh my gosh, this was awful. It was awful. I hated it. It was so <laughs> bad. But I loved this professor and I like didn't want to disappoint him. Like that was my biggest fear. So every time I would just like make myself drink this, you know, fire <laughs> scotch. <laughs> but then I got a taste for it and you start to kind of develop, you know, learn to, to you know, find, it just sounds so snobbish, but you, you have the palate and you taste the different parts of it. And anyway, I started to really love it and explore it. And then the first time I went to Scotland, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best. And I just want to, drink whiskey every day in, in these small towns in the right. highlands and I would be happy. But yeah, it's, it's, it's enough of a love that I put it in my, my bios for things. Yeah. And because it, it sometimes surprised people because people don't associate women with whiskey drinking that yeah. often. And so I like to, you know, challenge the norm. And it may or may, or may not, women in and may or may not few some, you know, legendary karaoke uh performances as well so uh alleged, no, it's it's alleged. they say that's what they say <laughs> um, I also i'll know neither confirm nor deny can't no we're not doing that uh, i also know this about you as well you should avid reader right smart as hell care about communities that you work in care about people uh but one night not too long ago we were having this very deep philosophical discussion about Star Wars, do you remember? <laughs> do you remember that? Do you want to? Do you want to share with people? Because we're talking about oh sort of whiskey gosh. infused philosophical conversations about the meaning of life, broadband, and the importance of communities. Uh, Megan and I were talking about sort of the Star Wars uh, franchise and its applicability. This is nerd stuff, folks. This is how smart Megan is. We're, we're doing that, you know, mythology and analogy between the Star Wars. Uh, franchise to to modern culture and life. Megan, do you want to delve into not just the the Star Wars point, but your your love of of of, of Star Wars and of, of of fiction and and what that all means? How does that drive your creativity? Well, I feel like you premised that right in that it was a conversation had with a lot of whiskeys. So I do I remember my exact my exact <laughs> very <laughs> philosophical comments on SARS. Um, no, I do. I do love. So and this is an interesting thing that I'll tie because I love sci fi and fantasy. Um, and, you know, when I first got into sci fi, um, movie wise, it was Star Wars. I was six years old. It blew my mind. It was like the best thing ever. You know, as Star Wars, Princess Leia for many years as Halloween. So what I channel here instead of Jace, this is actually Princess Leia. Sorry, Jace. But <laughs> um, you know, and but the first sci-fi book I read was an Isaac Asimov book, mm -hmm. and he was a uh, physicist, um, I believe, an astrophysicist, and he so his, it was a lot of science in these science fiction books, 
and they're all technology, right? And so, you know, uh, it's this kind of love of seeing what could be in the future if we had the best technology and resources possible, which, you know, to bring it to broadband is what can happen when people like you have maybe a brilliant person, you have the next Isaac Asimov and rural Kansas and, you know, but he's, he's not having, she, let's make it a she, she doesn't have the broadband and, and, you know, there's so much potential and, and possibility in people, especially young people. Um, but if there's not the opportunity through, through internet to, to get there, you know, we're probably missing out on some great sci-fi novels and some great twists to the star Wars franchise, which recently have really helped to revitalize it. I think without Mandalorian, it would have been, you know, continue to suffer, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, but, actually, but, you know, it, it brings potential. Yeah, I've used the analogy. People ask me, you know, since joining Ready and Broadband Money, how does it feel to be back on the private side? And I'd say I'm still a Jedi Knight, right? My my, my, my lightsaber is still, is still blue, as you can tell, uh, and I'm fighting on the right side of the force. So there is, you know, the analogy being a, a another person that, that loves sci-fi and, and, and the sci-fi movies, uh, particularly the Star Wars franchise, um, you know, there is applicability in it that that resonates with with people uh, and the community. So I will say, I think I was called a wizard, though. <laughs> I will request to be changed to a Jedi of Grants of Broadband Grants. Not, so yeah, let it be noted. Jedi is a little cooler than wizard. Like noted. Yeah, yeah. The wizard yeah. is kind of. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna go change my my profile on this yeah. on broadband. Maybe money. too nerdy for Jedi. someone who tears down karaoke performances like on a whim right that's a little too cool let's go with jedi multifaceted absolutely all right let's get back to the questions maybe before we go too far <laughs> off script we have a really good question uh from adam puckett that at, that and he asked excuse me um, megan you're the goat since you work across the country in lda when you work across the country can you highlight particular states or state broadband offices that you see being models um, that other state broadband offices or directors should look for for best practices. Let me change that up so we don't have to name drop. Are there characteristics for those state broadband offices that are doing things well? Can you highlight those characteristics and what the newer offices that are just getting started, what they can learn uh, from those that are doing it well? So let's stay away from, from name dropping a little bit. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, but I will know. say no, I'm kind of kind of going to go at this from from two two viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, one one is going to be you know there are some states that are doing fantastic community engagement um, beyond what I think is is required by BEAD, um, and I think that that is critical in making sure that the money is used in the right way. Um, you know, we always say it's people, not projects. Mm -hmm. um, and so actually getting out into the community, like some states are doing very well. I think others are, are maybe either late to the game or struggling with it, but um, is, 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 you know, critical and important. And, you know, even if it wasn't required in BEAT, I would strongly encourage states to do that because, again, it is so important to make sure that the money is used correctly um, and that it's getting where the need is greatest. And you know, we all have our thoughts on the maps and, you know, you're not going to really learn it until you're on the ground with the people. So Absolutely. I think there's some states really doing that well. And I, I would encourage states who haven't started it to start it now. Like it is, it is so important. I can't overstate that. Um, and then there's, there's some grants that or some grants, there's some states that I think have been doing grants very well and that, you know, whether they're just getting their pilot project going or pilot grant or, you know, whether they've been doing it for a few years. Um, I think learning from other states and what has worked well in grants and what has been an issue um, is, is going to make the whole process a lot easier, right? And so, you know, not to tell the broadband directors what to do. And I know they have their working groups and they communicate and hopefully they're sharing kind of those lessons learned of we put together this application you know, on this platform and no one could use it, or we had this question and everyone answered it weird and wrong and it was a billion different reasons. And, you know, so what do you need to be asking? How do you need to be phrasing this? So there have been some states that I think have had some very um, easy to do and successful grant programs that they've been given tools, I would say, you know, 
states, look at other states that you, your map is very easy to use for those who are applying, um, that it's understandable, that people can have access to it, um, that it can pull the data that they need, um, you know, which takes, which means investing in, in someone who can help you develop and build that, that map. But um, having a robust and very helpful broadband map for applicants um, makes things so much easier. Um, you know, we've had had applications in different states and some are, are much, much better than others. So another kind of consideration is, is, you know, looking at the tools and resources that you're giving your applicants to make sure that they can be successful. Um, and maps are, are a huge part of that. Absolutely. All right, Megan, we got five minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question. But before I do, where can folks come? to uh, the community to find more about uh, Learn, Design, Apply and the work that you're doing? Uh, where can folks uh, access to find more information about, about you and the work that uh, LDA does across the country? Yeah, obviously our website. Um, I would also say our LinkedIn. So we post you know, a lot about what our different staff members are doing, You know, posting about different grant programs that we've been participating in. So we, um, you know, a few weeks ago, finished up helping, I think, 80 something applications for school safety programs, which, you know, so proud of my colleagues who, who did that. That was a huge undertaking. Um, and then obviously on there also posting about our broadband work and, you know, where where we're seeing things and uh, always have some grant writing tips, which I think are helpful. So uh, our LinkedIn is, is, I think, one of our more helpful and popular and useful pages. Um, and then also a great way to get in, in contact as well. So, um, you know, a, a good good way to learn about us and see who we are, right, by what we're doing there. So, do you have any upcoming conferences or webinars that you are speaking at or conducting? So, coming, to, I'm not doing I think anything until August, okay. um, but I'll be speaking at the ISC Expo um, and going to talk. Uh, kind of at length on cybersecurity. And so if you're going to ISC Expo, please come hear me talk about cybersecurity. It's my newest big passion. Um, and then also at the Mountain Connect conference um, where I will be on a panel with some of the wonderful folks from, from uh, ReadyNet, broadband.money on diversity and inclusion. Um, and then also one about grant and what is happening in the grants realm. So um, if you're at either of those conferences, please come. Um, also possibly going to be hosting a webinar on, on B, but also the FFA, the last mile grant in California. So if you are in California um, and have questions on that, thoughts on that, definitely reach out and, and keep in touch to see if that webinar is coming. Absolutely. Megan, my final question to you today is sort of philosophical and deep. Uh, we talked about the blankie. We talked about the BS meter that goes off in the background. Uh, but, but thinking about this comprehensively, right, what keeps you up at night as you are working with communities across the country? We're on the precipice of these big announcements that are going to impact communities for generations to come. You know, what is it that 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 you're concerned about uh, as we as we approach this next phase of of uh, of bead and digital equity and, and the other broadband investments that are coming? The thing that keeps me up at night is whether, and I think maybe I mentioned it before, whether the people who, who can really utilize this money are prepared, because a lot of times it is the smaller uh, ISPs, the rural ISPs, the co-ops, um, municipalities, I think, you know, both public and private is needed, but the small players, right, who historically may have not gotten this money, whether they're prepared, because there is going to be so much required of them both during the application process and afterwards, you know, with the com compliance and reporting, like you said, and I want I want them all to be prepared. I want all the wonderful people we work with to be prepared. Um, and there's some hefty lifts, you know, I, I mentioned very briefly the NIST cybersecurity requirement. Um, and if that's not something you have in place, that's a huge undertaking and, and something you need to do now because you don't want to learn about that when the program opens and see that that's something you need to have and, you know, you don't have it or you don't have your cyber supply chain risk management plan and um, or you, you haven't thought about your workforce. And, you know, I think I think we need to talk a lot 
more about what beat is going to require of people that we do know so mm -hmm. people can get a head start on it because it, it isn't something you want to just start thinking about when a program opens um you know and i want i want every tribe to get the money they need to to deploy their networks and you know are they prepared and i think tribal ready is doing a great job making sure they are but you know some tribes aren't and so the, i think what keeps me up is is people not being ready and then missing out um and how can our small little firm i mean we're a team of seven eight but you know we can only do so much and so um yeah well, well, but i have hope you do you're the you're the eternal optimist you're a true professional you're really the OG goat and uh, you really care about your work. And I think that manifests in everything that you do, whether it's speaking, whether it's working with communities or leading the broadband programs over at LDA. So Megan, I wanna thank you uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, as one of your, your, your friends, I, it's truly a joy to be with you. Um, and I, I look forward to our continued work um, and, and karaoke explosion experiences uh, together as, as we move forward. So. Thank you, everyone. That's all the time that we have today with Megan Bearsford of the uh, Learn Design Apply. I'm going to put the emphasis on, <laughs> on your on name. The There's a backstory there <laughs> that we'll, we'll share with people. Uh, but we have some upcoming events to announce here uh, on the platform, on the I.O. community. Uh, where's the funding on June 14th, Episode 6, Securing Matching Funds Efficiently. And that'll be hosted by Gary Bolton and the team here. Uh, at ready.net and broadband money, but just look forward to that on June 14th. And then another special edition of Ask Me Anything on June 16th, Friday, June 16th, with Josh Hildebrandt, the Director of Broadband Initiatives at the Georgia Technology Authority of the Georgia Broadband Office, uh, is going to be sitting in for Jessica Simmons. We had announced Jessica Simmons, but now Josh Hildebrandt, the Director of Broadband Initiatives, uh, will be uh, sitting in on that. So uh, for this version of Ask Me Anything on Friday, June 9th. Thank you all for being with me. And again, Megan, we wish you the best. Thank you so much. To Ben, thank you so much. And everyone, uh, we go forth and prosper, right? Can I do that? <laughs> Even though that's not... I mean, so wrong franchise, but okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's not franchise, but it's close enough. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for, right. uh, for Thanks, joining. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Scott. Thank you, Megs. Have a great one. All right. Bye. Bye.